Uh, let's go to Q and A session now, though. So, who wants to go first? And again, you can raise those hands with. Uh, let me see. Option Y on Mac or Alt Y on Windows. I know the high voltage or the builds up will restore it more okay. and more electronic. And let me see, Nil, uh, Nils, go for it, sir. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, Charlie, well, well done for uh, putting together all the components and getting something to move. Uh, my question is, uh, how important is the uh, ultrasound to make the the effect that the, the Russian guy is claiming? Uh, it can can we do without that, or is that a really essential part? Yeah. Good question. And our podcast out there, I'm sure before Dr. Dry has been studying. We, we can't hear your voice very clear. Can you move the mic closer to your mouth? Um, sure. Let me try to. How about now? Can you hear me A little bit better. It, it's a little muddy, but it's not horrible. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Sort of. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit, a little bit. Okay, great. Yeah, then we started. So, yeah, I believe the ultrasound is necessary to create the lift. And Alex Jarkov said it's needed. And that's one of the keys that he mentions when you adjust the parameters, the ultrasound frequency needs to be adjusted so you get the right lift. So that's one of the more complex part of it, especially because it's ultrasound, you can't hear it around 200 kilohertz. And then Tardis Yato from Wartec has tried doing the verifier with just the high voltage on the plates and the AC on, on the center and volume without the AC, and we haven't seen any results that were positive. Okay, so so Charlie, I, I think one of the things that would help is if you enunciate a little bit better, speak up and enunciate a little bit better, um, you know, it seems it seems like the mics on your machines might be having some issues, and that, that's that's okay. You know, it, it happens, but um, yeah, just just try and maybe project your voice a little bit and enunciate a little bit more. So, if it's okay, I would like to ask you um, before I go to our next question. I want to ask. Well, I, I missed a lot of your presentation. You have this kit from Alexei Chakurkov. I know he's been sending you bits and pieces of information along the way. Have you gotten any results that indicate that this thing might might work? No, my, I myself haven't seen any results. I haven't been testing it on the scale, so I've only seen it through the lift. And even if it falls over or jumps, that would be some results. I haven't seen that yet. Okay, okay. Uh, let me go the electronics and that would probably help with i believe the noise cancellation and the high voltage is yeah game. yeah yeah do, do yeah please please tim i had one more question yeah go for it nils okay um charles uh, can you share that uh, youtube uh, playlist that you showed on uh, on the video today i'll be interested to watch some of those videos yeah, just, just, public playlist. just just the playlist can you, where yeah. where can i see get that I could post it here in the Zoom. Meeting. Oh, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and, and, and just on the ultrasound to leave that, uh, is it a yes or no uh, on the question? Is that an essential part? Yes. Alex Sherkov said all the designs he's used that Create a Lift was using ultrasound. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nils. Okay, let me go to Michael Boyd next. Hey, Charles, can you hear me okay? Hello, yeah, coming clear. So uh, just the observation as far as the audio, if you would remain uh, totally still when you're you're speaking because the, you're, you, it sounds like you're using a condenser microphone somewhere and if you move the, the direction, it's since it's so directional dependent, it distorts your, your words when you move. So I suggest you remain uh, remain as still as possible. That's just a suggestion, of course. So my question is about, um, the, you broke down the different components, but one of the things I heard is you didn't have a way to measure 
the frequency was one of the things I heard. I, I, and I'm curious if you have a way of measuring the uh, field strength of the Tesla coil. Yep, I have uh, oscilloscopes and other measuring equipment that I use. Uh, Do you have an electric field meter of any for source? No. Nope. Okay, so um, I have this device that's called a, a tri field meter. And what it does is it measures uh, EMF, ELF, and RF. It's cost about a hundred bucks. It's called a, a it's called a GQ EMF dash three ninety. I, I uh, put it put a, the the information in the chat, and I would suggest uh, you use that. Uh, get one of those meters. And the advantage of this meter is it, it it uses a USB interface to your computer, and it comes with a, a data collection algorithm. So you can collect the data and that way you could actually measure the frequency and the field strength of both the electric fields and the magnetic fields. And I think that would be very useful. Um, I, my concern with what you're trying to do is you have so many variables that you're trying to align that it's kind of difficult to resolve it. So what I would suggest is you start off with the basic equipment, your RF source. Also, um, how are you measuring the um, the uh, um, the uh, what is it ultrasonic frequency? Are you measuring that? No, currently I don't have any meters that could detect so, the ultrasonic. But you're using a piezoelectric coil, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you can use one, what I suggest you do is you get another piezoelectric uh, sensor and that one is the one that you measure with because see the way these piezoelectric uh, dev devices work is you can either apply a voltage to it and make it, so basically a, uh, uh, a crystal oscillator is a type of piezoelectric device. It's like what they made the first, ra the first radios were made with crystal oscillators, quartz crystal oscillators. So um, you can either drive it with a voltage or you can uh, measure with it. So if you have two of them, you have one that you're driving and then another one that you're measuring with, you can actually measure the, 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 the frequency of your ultrasound. That would be another uh, key parameter for you to be able to uh, tune this because basically it's a tuning operation and what you're trying to do my understanding is create a harmonic basically where the phases match so that they cancel out the gravitational field effect it's basically my understanding is it's a kind of like um a gravity filter kind of like what ron keto is doing but from a different approach is kind of how i look at it so I, 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 I uh, feel uh, confident that the, the, this device is real, but I think th there's an issue with uh, the parameters. We don't have a, a firm uh, grasp on what's going on at, at the uh, you know, system level with this. So these are just some suggestions I have. Get another piezoelectric crystal for a sensor and uh, get one of these EMF meters that I described so that you can actually record your data. Okay, and you're, as far as the piezoelectric sensor, that's something you can plug into your oscilloscope. So you can collect the signals on your oscilloscope. Okay, and um, my final question is, we're talking at one point about 2,480 volts was one of the parameters I saw. How do you measure that? That's so cool. I had a high voltage probe when I measured that. Oh, so you have a, a high voltage probe that I'll measure that high voltage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Okay, thank you. That's uh, all my comments and questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, I actually have a meter here that helps detect. Yeah, and I think it's yeah, yeah, like yeah. Too. you know, Charlie, I should I should jump in really quick too. 
Um, so for, for future presentations, because I absolutely want to have you back, you've done a couple, we should probably keep all of the high voltage and stuff off mm -hmm. because it, yeah, it really trashed your mic and uh -huh. it, I, I wasn't even able to really break through, which, which was sad because you have okay. such amazing material and you're so diligent, you know, so. So I'm you. still curious, what was that meter you were showing? Uh, it's similar to the one you're saying, it records the radiation, then you can look it up later on the computer. Oh, that's a GMC 320. Is that a uh, yeah. electromagnetic field meter? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, and that, that should have, does it have a USB port on it? Yes. So you can interface that with your computer, correct? Correct. Did you, did, did you download the software that goes with that? I've just been recording, you haven't downloaded it yet. Yeah, I suggest you do that. You'll, you, I think that may be uh, equivalent to the 390. I don't know if it's a tri field meter or not, but I can't really okay. tell from there. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And for the oscilloscope, we have multiple channels on that. So I'll be using that to measure multiple signals at once to see how they interact with each other. We're still working on that. Yeah, that's what you need to, to uh, get your, your harmonic resonance that you're going to need to get lift. Yep, and it was a good idea with the piezoelectric. I've been measuring the AC signal it's used to power the piezo, but it's a good idea to, to use another piezo to resonate at that uh, frequency, and then I could be able to pick up the voltage and the signal on that on the one near it. So I'll try that. So I, I have a question. This is John Reed. Um, uh, Charlie, uh, John, did, could me? I could I get you to turn on your camera, John, if that's okay? Oh, I'm sorry that the camera's not working at the oh, moment. Okay. So, yeah, well, um, go, go ahead, sir. Yes, Charlie, because many of us could not understand you clearly in what you were saying, I'm wondering if you would happen to have a transcript of your presentation or maybe an outline that you could send to us. Okay, I could send the PowerPoint, but yeah. no transcript of it. You, you know, Charlie, you could put that right into chat, actually. You can upload files into chat if you wanted to do okay. that, and everybody could get it there. Sure. Yeah, I did it now. Jeez. Thanks so much, Charlie. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah. And, and again, Charlie, I can't thank you enough for presenting. We, you, you know, <laughs> technical stuff happens. It, it is what it is. So. Yeah, it was actually pretty good because the Gravit Flyer is known for its high electromagnetic fields. So I was worried it would even distort the Wi-Fi and disconnect me. But luckily, it didn't build up enough to do that. So. But you do see that there is fields that are invisible that are interfering with electronics. Yeah. Well, let me go to let me go to Morgan next. Uh, Morgan, go for it. And and again, if you could turn on your camera, sir, that would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, uh, so uh, yeah. So nice presentation, by the way. Um, I wanted to just uh, I, I don't know if I missed this, but what actually is uh, uh, occurring on the gravity flyer itself? I see that you have like rotating magnetic fields and voltages applied to it, but mm -hmm. what's actually like? Can you describe a little bit about what that actual device is doing? You know what I mean? Like, what, you know, if there's some whatever, because I mean, we're talking about phase matching and things like this, but what's actually happening on the device? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yep, so there's three main uh, forces, the high voltage sawtooth on the top and bottom disks, and the AC signal on the center disk, and the ultrasound above, on the cone above it. And there's also the spinning magnets roll north facing up, which does create like another AC signal on the center plate. So is this but like the a theory exactly what's creating the lift? Is, the, it, is the, it like a capacitor? The theory of it is still debatable. You said you said two plates with can, a soft two plate. Right. Okay, so a capacitor right. with a plate on the inside and then a rotating magnetic field below it. Uh, yeah, part of the capacitor is the bottom rotating disc that has the magnets on it. So you can say the bottom portion of that capacitor is you know, has the magnets. And then the center AC signal obviously says it is to use to separate the spinning magnetic fields on the top and bottom. I see. Okay. So so the magnetic fields are inside of the capacitor. And then you have an additional sawtooth uh, oscillate of uh, electric field on the inside of that, of that as well. Well, there's the plates are the capacitor. So there's the charge on the plates, for the sawtooth, high voltage. And it's DC or AC? Or no, okay, that's AC. Um, and then the, for the capacitor plates, is that DC or AC? Well, on the, 
the plates are the, the high voltage. Yeah, I guess you could say you know, it's a sawtooth, so it's like an AC. And the center is AC from Tesla coil, high voltage wireless energy. So the capacitor, there's no real like other like a capacitor in there. It's, the whole thing acts like a capacitor. Uh, there see. is a video on Alex Chekhov's website that he draws out the fields and when he thinks uh, the two torsion field video. Okay, yeah, that's on that list of those YouTube videos. Yeah, okay, I'll check those. There's one, yeah, I saw there was a presentation where he kind of explains what's going on with this, right? Yep, I can share my screen again real quick to show it. Uh, here it is. So after the schematic, and yeah, I'd recommend translating it to English. He later goes into what the fields look like and drew them I, I on the side here. Can you can you go back yeah. there? Is that one picture? Can you uh, of the actual device itself? Can you kind of explain what's going on on the device, just just for a point of reference, or like with this diagram here? Sure. This is an older one, so it shows magnets on top and bottom. But in later designs, he only has the magnets on the bottom just. So it's kind of like a acting as a capacitor. It's the top positive, the bottom negative, and the center okay. has the AC. You, you know, if, if I could jump in, one of the things that kind of stands out to me is a lot of people have accused Alexei of being a fraud, but um, the amount of work that he has put into documenting this is is pretty insane. You know what I mean? I, I, I've seen I've seen my share of frauds, and usually it's kind of surface level with a couple of cheesy schematics, and that's it. He's he's built several models of these. He keeps testing them and putting videos up. He's got detailed schematics. He's trying to outline fields. It, I mean, I, I guess it's possible, but it just seems like the time and energy investment that's gone into this is more than you know more than I would expect, I guess, if he was making it all up. That's true. And I also would suggest going to Rex Research. They have a great page explaining their theory of gravel flyer here in more detail. And what they think, this is the sawtooth signal that they uh, showed was a little different than what I observed by actually measuring it. They took screenshots from several videos and they go into the construction. Yeah, and a lot of written text on this description. But they, again, they're using the older version of using magnets on top, which isn't in the later designs. And do you have any idea of what the magnets are actually doing? They're spinning, but I, besides that, I don't know. But I, I've tried to measure the plates uh, when there's no high voltage applied and there's an AC signal created by the spin magnets. And then is the, uh, the, the, the voltages that are, excuse me, the, the well, I guess the, the, the frequency that's on the, so you have the two plates with the one in the middle, are these things at the same frequency or what's the relationship between the, 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 the frequency of the middle plate and then the frequency of the two plates on the outside? Is there some relationship mm -hmm. with those? All right, well, they're all different frequencies, but somehow they have to kind of resonate together according to Alex Chekhov. So that's the part I'm still trying to figure out exactly what and he doesn't have an oscilloscope so he hasn't been able to measure the exact frequencies of once lifting because so well, it exactly. does i mean at least kind of makes sense because if you have some i guess a charging capacitor you got an electric field on the inside and then if you have the middle plate where you're putting charge on that that can create a lift you know i don't understand what the magnets are doing but but uh yes yeah, so, but that would be at the same frequency you know if you have both of those at the same frequency with some phase i guess you have to get lucky with that but it seems like that could create a lift that's interesting stuff. Okay, okay, okay. That, that, that cool presentation, actually. Thank you so much. Th thank you as well, Morgan. Okay, uh, let me go to Michael, who has been patiently waiting. Mr. Sullivan? Hello. Um, I was just curious if you ran any simulations uh, to help you troubleshoot it. Um, I myself haven't. I've looked into simulating some of the circuits earlier on, but I found it was very difficult. It was, you know, SPICE was what I was using because the high voltage is difficult to simulate. It was better just to build a quick prototype to show that it's working. And I was able to build early models of the Tesla coils and high voltage equipment before simulating it. So P spice, you mean? Or yeah, uh, spice? Right, right. The, the free uh, spice program for uh, making uh, models of uh, the electrical circuits. I was just curious. That's all I have. 
Yeah, but, but in our uh, WhatsApp group, there is some that have been studying it more from the theoretical and they've done more with simulation than I have uh, to show mostly the electromagnetic fields around the route flyer, which, uh, yeah, I don't quite understand, but from their results, it shouldn't fly, basically, <laughs> what the simulations say. So there's not something new to the theory that needs to be added. Yeah. Well, and again, Charlie, from, from what you've seen so far, it, you, you haven't seen any effect yet, right? You haven't, I mean, ha, now, have you seen anything strange? Have you seen anything that might suggest that something is going on? No, we, all the components are working in, individually, and yeah, I've been happy with uh, receiving the kit. So nothing strange that I can see. Okay, I wasn't sure. Well, I, I was thinking like some kind of weird, you know, I mean, Lord only knows, right? But like a glow mm -hmm. or some kind of a discharge or something that might be like, hey, you know, something's happening here. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I've been keeping an eye out for those. They're known as like the Hutchison effects, uh, but I haven't seen them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, let, let me see. Uh, and Harold, uh, Harold is here. Harold, don't be shy, sir. Harold had a question. There we Thank go. you. I just have problem with this spectrum internet. What I want to ask if Charles, if he has done a free body diagram of the forces in the system and the physics behind the creation of those forces. I, I mean, the analysis, the circuit analysis is beautiful, perfect, great detail. Good job on that part. But what about the physics behind the thrust output? Yeah, I myself haven't done the, the physics behind it. I'm more uh, electrical engineering students. So I prefer to build and test the electrical components. That's why I focus on the electrical, mechanical, and not so much the math and the physics of it at this time. But I, I believe once we get it flying and lifting, then we'll be able to study it more and understand it better from the physics side. Do you know if anybody here has done it? Because so far, I came across a, uh, an analysis by Russian about a few months ago, which actually he claims that his analysis proved that Alexis uh, machine should not work. And that's what I'm wondering because I mean, a plus in marketing for Alexis, it's a great machine. I mean, he has opened a lot of door. I mean, a lot of interest, you know, and uh, everybody around the planet is looking for that, you know, the Gordon Trophy, you know, the working machine, and uh, he has done a good job on that. So, which is good for the profession in a way. It stimulates a lot of interest, but that particular design, I mean, has anybody, do you know anybody who have done the physics behind it? Mm -hmm. uh, apart, you know, from Todd de Seattle, I know he, he made a good presentation uh, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. Yep, Todd's been working on it, right? But even his theory doesn't completely explain the function of the gravel flyer, even the ultrasound. There's nothing in the physics or uh, electronic books that would explain its interaction with the field. So if it does work, then there would be new physics to understand why it's operating. And uh, Ben Solomon is another, Benjamin Solomon is another professor researching the gravel flyer, and he's done some of the physics of why it might be lifting. And he's there's part of a meetup, anti gravity today, which I'm, I've joined that group, but they haven't met recently. And they're trying to figure out the physics of why the gravel flyer would work. But there's still a lot of people speculating and none that prove why it should work. Have right now, tried, have you tried? Have you tried out um, uh, Dr. Paul Lavillette's um, some quantum kinetics? He was here early. I think he's left. He was here earlier on. Paul Lavillette, some quantum okay. kinetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his theory might explain it, but I'm not, not familiar with it. Yeah, well, let me let me go. If it's okay, let me go to Theo, who has his hand up. Yes, hello ah. everyone. Just switching my video on. Uh, thanks, uh, Charlie. Great talk. Very interesting. I have a, a question concerning the uh, bottom plate. Uh, is there a reason why you connect this to the minus? I mean, it seems to be important. You have the minus below in the bottom plate, in the bottom bottom disc, and the plus in the upper one. Did you, the Russian guy tell you if that's important and why? Yep, he said it was important. Um, why, what inspired him was he 
he said the earth is negative and the sky is positive and he wanted to repel the earth. So he, he put the bottom plane as negative, but also the lifter circuits mostly use um, positive on the thin wire on the top and negative on the bottom. You can get lift the other way, but it works better by having positive on top. So either just by trial and error or from studying some of that theory, what led them to that? I believe that's the better way to go. Thanks. Oh, and thank you as well, sir. Uh, let, let me go back to Michael. So I had, uh, I'm curious, you, at one point you were showing uh, uh, in, in IR image, imaging of the um, device when you were operating it. And uh, I noticed that, uh, so basically, there were a lot of places in the circuit within the device that it appeared to be heating relative to the, the background ambient temperature. I could see the cooling effect on the edges like you mentioned due to the spinning of the disc. Um, I, I worked in uh, RF electronics and in, in RF electronics, you use a lot of uh, surface mount devices. And I saw a lot of the connectors and stuff you were using in there. They definitely were not surface mount. Um, and those could be the points of your, your uh, resistive loading that's basically causing uh, it to uh, heat up at the wrong place and, and, and make it so you don't have a sufficient uh, field strength. Basically, it's leaking current. And so it, it, the, 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 that's a good, a good thing for, I think, you to look at is look at all any of the internal circuitry where you're using, uh, where you're not following um, RF uh, requirements for your, for your, your interconnection. You do, you, uh, um, I'm curious, you, uh, do you have any experience with RF circuitry? Yep, uh, all these circuits were designed and built by Alex T. Chekhov, and I think he chose them mostly because of the availability of them. There are some older electronics, but they're more heavy duty and they lasted over the years. So he's selected the simpler circuits to power the flyback transformer for old TVs and uh, for the switching transistor for the um, Tesla coil, and also for uh, most of those transistors he's using are at very high frequency, and that's why they're heating up. And he just uh, solves that by putting it onto a heat sink. So even if it was surface mount, Actually, it would. I'm, I, I'm a little confused. What I'm talking about is the actual uh, Gravifier device. You are showing imaging, IR imaging of that, and I could see uh, heat loading in some of the imaging spe specifically it looked like it was in the, the um, ultrasonic cone that you had on the top there it looked like there was something heating up in there what what why would th that be the case if it if it wasn't due to basically a bad connect a non-omic connection is what i'm concerned about okay yeah the motors he's using are 12 volt brushed motors like for fan cooling and he's spinning them pretty fast and they're designed to have a load on them so he screwed on the plates which have a charge and there's a bit of backwards torques on that so that's what's causing the motors to overheat I believe that's most the heat on the gravel flyer from what you're seeing it might be some from the piezoelectric device that's resonating at very high frequency and then therefore heating up but I believe most of the heat you saw was from the motors that are overheating from the motor and and why was it look like it wasn't uh, it was offset to one side it wasn't like central it wasn't like in the middle that's mm -hmm. what so basically it needs to be symmetric that that heat should look like it's in a symmetric ring not not off to one side that's what what uh was of concern i felt concerned about that because that could be a non that could be due to a, to a bad connection is what i'm saying Okay. Yeah, it might have to do with how the thermal camera works. So it's also using the camera from my phone, which is slightly offset to compare it with the thermal camera that's connected to the bottom. 
and maybe when those two images are overlaid, it looks a little offset, but it should be more symmetrical than it actually is in the video. Okay, thank you. These are just some observations. Okay. Michael, yeah. thank, thank you as well. Charlie, that is a, that is a hardcore looking phone. <laughs> And that's enormous. That is an enormous phone. Is that a Samsung? It must be a Samsung, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it's giant. It's like, okay. Um, so let me see who else has questions. You know, so uh, Dawn had mentioned in chat um, that tweaking until something works can mask an accumulation time. And so that's something I, I'd like to speak to that a little bit. That's something that Mark and I and many other people, I'm sure, Charlie, you're probably familiar with it as well. Um, one of the things that, that we've all seen reports of are, are what are called nonlinear effects, right? Where they, where they scale and they tend to scale exponentially and below a certain threshold, you see absolutely nothing. And then once it gets above that, then it can become you know, quite pronounced. So that would be to, to his comment. Uh, and then let me see. Well, Tim, yeah. that's yeah. a very accurate statement you made, you know, that did made, and you made it better with your analysis, even better. Oh, well, it thank you. True. The, the, the person that I got that from was laser physicist John Daring, who studied this stuff for many, many years. Uh, he worked with Dr. James Corum, the, and James Corum translated, he retranslated Einstein's unified field theory. He did the 21 and 27 versions. Um, they also worked with the guy who wrote the book, uh, not William Moore, the, the, or yeah, it was William Moore, and he worked with Charles Berlitz. They worked with the guy who wrote the book on the Philadelphia experiment. And so they, they tried to reverse engineer a ton of little projects, and they were also aware of several others. And one of the things that Daring told me again and again and again was he said, all of these effects are nonlinear in nature. You won't see anything until it starts to happen. And then once it happens, it starts to scale very rapidly. So, thank you. Yeah, well, guys, we're, oh, you know what? We have more questions. Okay, good. We're, we're, <laughs> we're running ahead of schedule. Let me go to Michael next, mm -hmm. sir. Hi there. Um, so yeah. I agree actually with, uh, with Michael Boyd about the EMF meter. Um, there's a whole bunch of RF equipment. It's like a probe. You just move it around in space. You don't, uh, the thing with oscilloscopes is, uh, you're going to get a ton of parasitic capacitance on the uh, the probes when you're when you're working with RF frequencies. I mean, if you're working down in the kilohertz, it's not going to matter too too much. But if you're using anything megahertz or some or even gigahertz, you're going to want an EF, EMF meter. I also recommend a software defined radio uh, SDR. There's tons of them on the web, and that will give you the whole EMF spectrum that things putting out. Um, in the megahertz and gigahertz range and, and kilohertz, depending on which one you buy. So very broadband uh, thing that you can scan through all the frequencies that are coming off the thing. It's very useful um, for RF stuff. And uh, let's see, uh, the nonlinearities, it's not just like a buildup or, or whatever of, of some effect. You can have, um, you can have, uh, chaotic behavior where you've got some random thing that happens and goes away and happens and goes away. Uh, you can have all sorts of things with nonlinearities. It's not just like build up over an extended period of time. And uh, well, I mean, we should expect there's a nonlinearity of some kind, or at least a way to create entanglement based on what Sarfati was saying the other time. Uh, the those nonlinearities, you, you basically need variable capacitance and variable inductance, and really, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can see how the piezo gets you variable capacitance a little bit, but I don't see anything where that that's changing the inductance. You might want to, you could try like uh, using uh, spessartine garnet or something, which is slightly paramagnetic, or you could use uh, pure gadolinium, something that's paramagnetic that won't have a loss tangent. Gadolinium oxides. Um, yeah, point being though, um, you're going to want to look at nonlinearities. You're going to want to try to create nonlinearities. Um, 
and there's there's probably some nonlinearity in the system that you're like may, probably a mechanical thing. I'd have to guess if if the if the ultrasound is anything uh, to do with it. But uh, beyond that, you're going to want to look at you're going to want to get yourself a the NMR spectrum of aluminum and steel and all these things, and the EPR spectrum if you can find it, because uh, then you'll be able to see the frequencies where you've got a nuclear and like an NMR or EPR response in the aluminum. And that uh, can help with uh, NMR entanglement um, at room temperature at, with macroscopic objects. So um, that's, that's a way to create entangled states that might have participate in the effect if it's gravitational. If it's something else, I don't know, but the piezo doesn't seem to provide enough power to produce that amount of lift if it's just like air or pressure waves or something. And I don't see how the spinning magnets do anything just based off of that. But yeah, I mean, just some ideas of where to go, what to look at, what to think about on the, on the theory side. And that'll hopefully help you direct the experiments a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to stick with Alex Chekhov's design for now, but I have a few ideas of how to improve and test different designs. Yeah, I mean, uh, at least get the NMR and EPR stuff. That'll give you some idea of where to look in terms of frequencies to operate stuff at. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Check well, the, the fields around it. Yeah, using those different meters. To get yeah, those. thank you. So, so let me go. Let me go to Tyler next. Uh, Tyler, go for it, sir. Hey there. I apologize. My camera's inoperable at the moment, but uh, my question is, as far as the mechanical operation of the system, how important is the balance of the rotating mass as far as excess harmonics that could affect other parts of the system? Okay, good question. I, no, I noticed from Alex Chekhov's design, he hand cut the plates and they're not well balanced. So there is a bit of vibration caused by that. And I'm not sure if that vibration is needed to create the lift, but I've seen other people use laser cut and it's much smoother when a CNC or laser cut materials are used. So yeah, it's still unknown right now if that little bit of wobble is needed or if it's uh, just a defect from this. Yeah, and Michael just posted in chat that mechanical vibration could create nonlinearities. And yeah, you know, and, and then who knows maybe, maybe there's an overlay maybe there's some kind of a beat frequency with uh, the ultrasonics right so okay well let me see who who wants to go next does anyone else ah there's nils nils go for it sir oops and oh i think nils just i think we just lost his connection uh, does anyone else have questions Ah, there's Theo. Theo, go for it, sir. Yes, uh, maybe this, uh, I hope you can listen to me. Uh, ju just one observation. In one of the videos, I saw the, the, the device floating in the air. There was no vibration. It was kind of static, which was very weird. You know, when, when you have a helicopter or an airplane, some, somewhere in the air, there is some, some moving. But that thing, when he was testing that there are no cables around it, that device was like stuck. It was not moving. So that was for me kind of very strange. Uh, it could be an anti-gravity effect uh, because it's another space-time continuum. But if you really look at the video, it's really like, yeah, not vibrating as you see it on the floor. So maybe that, Give some thoughts. Thank you. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah, what happens well, when it lifts up, but it looks like it is more stable. It might be similar to like a electromagnetic lift, like a maglev trains. They're very stable. It, yeah, it looks locked. like like locked. Uh, you know, when you mm -hmm. there is this magnetron, this little uh, uh, thing that you can spin, and, and then it has. A magnetic field against the opposite magnetic field and it levitates the levitron I, I think it's called the levitron and when that thing is moving you can see it spinning a little bit like unstable 
but but this thing is just there sticking in the air that's amazing you, that's you know theo that's that's an interesting comment that reminds me of the lifters the lifters were the same way they, right. they had kind of their own inertial it just yeah yeah, they had their own inertial field, you know, and with the lifters, we had them tethered, but, but I noticed they resisted motion. Uh, they would resist air currents, right? If an air current was trying to push it, it would resist yeah. that. Um, you could take a stick and touch the tethers and it would resist a change in axis. So, so yeah, with, with Alexi's thing, it does seem like the same thing. And, right. and then the other thing that I've noticed is in his videos, there is some kind of, it looks like a discharge time, right? When he turns it off, You'll notice there's a lag before it drops. So yeah. it's like a gravitational locking mechanism. It's like you have the static Earth's gravitational field, and then the device locks into it. And it's that's why it looks like it's static because and then it's not subject to uh, like vibration modes and it's not subject to the wind or anything like that because it's like locked into the gravitational field. So but it's not, it's levitating. At the same time, it's levitating. So yeah, yeah. Makes sense. I saw that Makes effect sense. too. And, and I think that's, uh, that, that shows that there's some kind of, uh, something's being aligned there between the magnetic and the electric fields along with the gravitational fields. And that's why, uh, and in, in this case, I think what's creating your gravitational uh, energy is actually the uh, ultrasonic source. Hey, Charles, do you think that there might be an ion wind effect uh, produced by the uh, middle plate in combination with the ultrasound, uh, the, the ultrasound and the magnet going on? Have you uh, considered or measured anything in that area? Ion wind, just to, at least a small portion? Yeah, I've done other lifters and those use much higher voltage to create lift. And this device weighs about one kilogram or 2.5 pounds. So it's much heavier than a lifter. So. Yeah, Harold, if I could jump in, an iron wind may contribute to some other kind of effect, but there's, there's, I could, from experience, there's no way you could produce ion, enough ion wind with that device to, to actually levitate it. Um, I mean, ion wind does a few ounces, you know, yeah. at the most. I, I agree with that because uh, if it does, it would be, you know, major uh, discovery, you know, large amount of ion wind, probably a small percentage, like you say, is agreeable. Unless otherwise, you know, Alex explained there is more. But what you said is reasonable. Thank you. Um, let me go back to Nils. Nils? Go for it, sir. Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I had my mic turned off. Apologize. Uh, Charles, um, have you heard of the term uh, cargo cult science? Oh, sorry. Okay, in uh, 1974, uh, Professor Richard uh, Feynman uh, held a speech on um, how there uh, some people, they try to go straight to the end result uh, uh, and skipping the middle part of the processing, the uh, the theory and the physics of how something works, and 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 you always end up with nothing if you do that. There there was a um, uh, uh, a small tribe of uh, humans on the Pacific Island somewhere in during World War II, and they saw the American cargo planes coming in uh, with supplies. Uh, to, to the military and, and they wanted to copy that. So they built airplanes uh, out of bamboo and grass and uh, headsets uh, out of grass straws and things. And they were hoping to, uh, I guess, build something that would uh, allow them to get food from the aircrafts coming in from the sky. So, so uh, back to your gravity flyer, um, if, if you're trying to just put together a a device with a bunch of parts and some instructions, isn't that really very, very inefficient way of going about things? Shouldn't we be spending the time trying to understand the physics and the principle and, and build a hypothesis behind this device before we even get to adjusting the frequency of the uh, Tesla coil or anything else? That's my question. Yeah, that's a good point. I heard that a lot. There's a lot to say 
you know, physics should be, you know, catch up first. I, even my dean of engineering said it was up to the physicist to first come up with theory before experimenting with it. But I, I said, we've already got a working device, so let's test that and then measure it and then come up with a theory to explain it. But yeah, there's several cases where first discoveries have been made and then theory comes later. Uh, even like the heavier than air flight of the Wright brothers uh, flyer, the, the Wright flyer um, was something that theory, you know, was on the fence of if it's possible or not. And there wasn't much to explain it. There's a few aerodynamic theories observed from water tests uh, before that. But in this case, I believe there's uh, first the device will come first and then theory will later explain it. But there might be some theories already out there that do explain it will fit. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I agree totally that, but there's so many moving parts in this device. You got the ultrasound, you got the magnetics, you got the high voltage. Uh, shouldn't we just focus on one part and then see if there's some effect uh, that we can measure and produce a hypothesis re around that? If there are some groups that are doing that. Uh, Todd oh, really? is an example. Do you have some yeah. links to any of yeah. those groups? Sure. Um, subscribe to their channel. Uh, I yeah, I've been, so I've been doing some work on this uh, electrogravity for years. And I, I think the okay. effect we're seeing here is a, is a B cross V field effect. It's, it's a divergent field. Uh, but uh, I'd like to see what your uh, contacts are saying about the physics or the principle behind it. Yeah, uh, I believe those theories, Warp Drive Tech is the one I'm talking about. I'll put that in the- Yeah, and that's Zoom. Todd's, right? I think that's yes. Todd's, yeah. Yeah, he's doing the approach of bottom up where he's testing each part individually to see if that's what's creating the lift and more the top down approach where I bought the kit and I'm testing the full yeah. set up. Let's, oh, so uh, if it's okay, let me go to Mark Sokol next. Who, who's been, oh, oh, it's Aiden. Okay, yeah, oh, sorry, Mark, Aiden. It's yeah. fine, Mark's, Mark's uh, disappeared from the lab for, but the um, backtracking a couple minutes ago, we were talking about the ion lifters and the, the stability. Um, that, that brings to mind uh, the 1952 uh, Kingman, Arizona UFO case. Uh, where like a, a vehicle came down and um, I, it had a, they sent out a recovery crew, but it was still powered uh, and they were having the, like they were trying to pick it up and then tilt it and put it on a trailer bed. But as they were trying to tilt it, the vehicle resisted and the crane ended up pulling itself up off the ground. So the, you know, there's, um, it's a, I guess, flux pinning from within the vehicle uh, and that the crew of the vehicle had to go in and power it down in order for them to, to uh, load it onto the trailer bed and take it into the deserts of Nevada. Um, so I've, you know, uh, one of my aerospace mentors who's been on this has talked about that and he said that there is on the more advanced vehicles there's some sort of you know, flux pinning that's going on which keeps it oriented um, uh, you know, and then the other term that they've, that has come out of, uh, my research on ufology is, uh, like gravity envelope. So perhaps the, uh, you know, the field stability or, uh, the vehicle when it's in resonance is creating this gravity envelope and we're seeing, a you know, a macroscopic flux pinning around it, um, which would describe, or, or, you know, would would describe that stability that the V the platform Chikurkov's platform seems to exhibit when it's up in uh, in the air. So that's just what I wanted to throw in. Yeah, good points. I know with the superconductors uh, with under on very cool temperatures, you get that flux pinning. So there might be something what's happening at room temperature. Yeah. Also, some of the yeah. Uh, yeah go ahead. Oh, like, uh, it seems to be like some sort of uh, macroscopic Cooper pair with the, the counter rotating discs. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, that would be part of what's going on, you know, but, but anyway. Yeah, and Bob Greener studying Hodgson effect to mention ball lightning and objects inside the ball lightning, like the sand and water were unaffected mm -hmm. by the temperature and time and even the gravity uh, around it. So maybe something like that's happening. There's a field building around it. That's and taking out of the, the gravity field of Earth on it. 
okay that's yeah i don't know <laughs> that's just why i wanted to put that into the group discussion so okay yeah well eden thank you thank you um so let me see who who else has questions we've got about 15 minutes left in our q a session and if we run out early, I'm sure Mike Mike will grace us with beginning his presentation early. So, but, but let's see. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, um, I'm curious what the uh, you, you were talking about what the uh, rotational uh, velocity was of the of the two discs. About 2,500. They're counter rotating, so almost around 6,000 RPM. So. Um, but do you know what the the linear velocity? Could you like measure the linear velocity, say at the edge of the disk? Um, if they're yeah, actually spinning, how do you know they're spinning counter to each other, the same uh, rotational velocity? Yeah, these DC fan motors only spin one direction. Even if you plug them in reverse, they only spin. Then they're the same model, so they're spinning the same and they're connected in parallel. So the same voltage and currents going to each of them. And they, they rated about uh, 3000 RPM each. And that's how we know. I have a tachometer as well that could measure. I need to put a reflective tape on there. Alex Sirkoff drew some Sharpie on the bottom to get a, a dark band uh -huh. on the reflective plate to measure the frequency and he measured it around 3000 RPM. So is there a dependence on the, the rotational frequency of the thing? That's a good question. Yeah, I think too fast, um, you won't see the result, and too slow also. So, but in his circuit, he had it going full speed, twelve volts to directly to the battery. So, in my uh, my uh, experiments with my invention, uh, there's a uh, I was going, I was using linear velocity, and in my case, I was doing in inches per second, and as the most of the measurements were at 500 inches per second and the reason i did it that way is because uh the the nano bumps and nano pits that are making were on a radius so i've like it, i was on an inner inner you know short distance of the radius i wanted to maintain the velocity at a constant value and then i also did it up to like 890 inches per second but essentially, in, in my case, there wasn't really much uh, effect on the magnitude by the, the, um, the speed. It had more to do with the size of the nano bump or nano pit. So in any case, I think uh, there's some importance there to make sure that, that both disks are synchronized. And then there's a, I'm curious if you've considered uh, some kind of uh, variation in the speed of the, or tried it at different rotational uh, speeds, essentially. Yeah, yeah, Alex or, Checker Cup. Yeah, his design has the potentiometer for adjusting the speed of the motors, mostly because when they first start, there's a bit of a backwards resistance to the magnets on the bottom disc. So you better start at a lower speed than ramp it up to 12 volts as you go on full speed. But I, I believe you're right that the size of the disk matter. That's why I went into detail of what the kit size was, which about eight and a half inches. So that would be able to reproduce it better. And I think a smaller scale, there'd be a lot less charge on the plates versus the larger size disks analysis. But the weight would be less, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So there's probably there might be a sweet spot for that too. You know? So, okay, well, that's, that's, uh, thanks again. I appreciate you. Thank you. Ah, I, I hear some background noise now. A little one waking up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, let me see who has questions next. We have about 10 minutes left. And, and again, if we, if we don't have any, we could probably go to Mike early. Oh, there's, there's Nils. Nils has another one. Okay. Go for yeah, it, sir. Good. Just a very quick question, uh, Charles. Uh, where are you going to put the links you mentioned about the YouTube playlist and your contacts to the guys doing research on the physics on the principle? I yep have the 
links um, in the chat here, but I could also share it. Maybe I missed something. Did you post it in the chat to everybody or? Back to on Zoom. Oh, 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 on, uh, yeah. It's been a big file, maybe it's still downloading. Oh, maybe well, that's it. Yeah, I'm not seeing the links either. So, no, I'm not seeing it. so okay. Okay. I could open so, it and just copy the link page into the chat. So, Tim, should I just wait then for the link to appear? Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think he's he's still working on it. Okay. Yep, so that's the YouTube from Alexi, uh, Facebook. My YouTube, my Thingiverse, and the Google Drive is the last link. Probably what interests people the most. It has more detailed pictures and parts list and video of me getting the kit at first. Wonderful. OK. Uh, so let me see. Other than the links, and I know he's working on those, does anyone else have questions? I do. I have a question. Hey, Lulu. Hi, hi, everyone. How's everyone? Happy New Year's. Um, yeah, yeah. Happy New Year. uh, I have a question. Your your meter, like your um, the one that's uh, 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 Michael is telling you to download the app, and so you can run the program so you could see the frequency. You know, the the oscillation of the frequency, right? Well, when you're downloading the app, aren't you somehow like connecting to the outside world? which is the net, like, you know, the internet, the world. And if anybody has any counter program, you're just like giving off information that, hey, you know, I'm working on this and now I, I'm, you know, downloaded the app and it gives them a trigger. So it can't be connected to the internet. It's gotta be connected to its own computer. If you really, you know, something that's not connected to, you know, anything else, you know, you know so you get real readings. Otherwise, it's gonna. You don't know if the readings manipulated by the app or by the internet connection or the Wi-Fi band or by. I mean, there's so many different variables once you, you know, plug into the you know the world. So you know you have to have it in your own system first, and then compare it with the outside systems. The outside systems, all these little gadgets that you need, you know, to connect to some outside server to, you know, to have it work. I mean, you don't have the server, you don't have the control, you know, you know, like it's just giving it into somebody else's hands, you know, everything you, you know, you've worked very hard for and, you know, for these big companies that, you know, have warehouses and warehouses of on running these, you know, different modules and these different algorithms, you want to have your thing, don't do it that way yet, do the older technology, like, you know, they're, they, like the other day, I saw this on Facebook, like an oscillator, like fifty dollars. They're selling this, like something built in, you know, maybe nineteen eighties, maybe. I mean, just the ones that work on the. You need stuff like that first, and then you know you go to the modern day and you cross reference, and you know these things also have a core, like um, a, a, an oscillation core. The older ones were half the pure stuff in them. Here now, the newer days, it's just you know commercial mass production. There's not any more, you know, extreme. Per it's just a machine that, you know, runs all of these. It's a block, you know, like you, there's no pockets, there's no variables. Old stuff work way better. You know, there is a human touch to them. It just, you know, keeps it more personalized. It keeps your invention yours, not everyone else's, you know. You know? Uh, anyway, but just, Start with your stuff first. Don't give it to the world yet. It's, it's good. <laughs> Gets concerned. Thanks. I'm not sure about this model, but I think uh, the signals record from this could be viewed offline. But I'll have to double check to see the app. Right, that'd be good to yeah, double check that it's offline. Let's make sure nothing's changed before uploading it or checking more than half that's connected. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you, Lulu. Um, so let me see, do we have, we got about five minutes left. Do we have any more questions? And every time I ask this, we have one that pops back open, so. Oh, there's Nils, okay, see, oh, go for it, sir. 
Okay. Um, Charles, um, we're still not seeing the links in the chat. Can you just post your email so I can send you a message or something? Sure. It's shapec2 at yahoo.com. You just type it. And you type it. Yeah. I know YouTube blocks other people from posting links. I'm not sure how Zoom does that without admin control. Maybe that's it. Yeah. You posted your email address? Um, maybe I've been sending it to you. You, you know what? Let me let me find it because I, I have it written down. Oh, uh, you know what it is? Yeah, I think I see what it is. It's not to everyone. Yeah, that was my worry. Okay. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Let me post yep. that again. I will yeah, put that yeah. in there as well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and now actually, Charlie, if you can post the links now, now that you've got it set. Sure. There we go. There you go. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. We're cooking along. And that's what it was. Thanks, Jones. Okay. okay. So I think we are just about there. We got about four minutes left. And ah, Gor uh, let me see. Gordon Hughes raised his hand. Gordon? Ah, there's. Uh, let, let me ask Gordon if he wants to unmute. Gordon, did you have a question, sir? Okay, and it looks. There it we looks go. Like... Yeah, we're working. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, happy New Year, folks. Um, just a, a general question: um, Where do you need to be? Uh, and 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 what do you need in terms of sort of resources going forward to actually get this thing to maybe work? Is there a plan going forward that you you know you can you need to get from A to B from where you are just now that will actually produce some sort of result with this? Uh, and what yeah. sort of resources do you need? Yes, yeah, so it needs a set of protocols and lab stuff and. The, that type of input, or maybe you know, some I put a, a, a note up in the, uh, the stuff earlier saying you know it might be useful to use some of the folks that are involved in this channel, like Mark or other people, and some of the expertise they could bring in from sort of lab side of things and uh, doing it, you know, sort of experimental work that might be able to. Uh, not interfere with what you're doing, but maybe put some sort of add-on to what you're doing that could maybe produce a result. Because at the end of the day, that you know, you want to, there seems to be something there with this. Uh, the question is, does it do what it claims to do? Uh, and the only way you're going to be able to do that with that uh, is probably with additional resources, not where you are now. Good question. I'm currently working with uh, Mark's team. Falcon space. We have a weekly meeting. We'll meet to talk more about the updates and then question and feedback. So I've been testing it myself, but they've also got their versions of the graph flyer they're building based on the schematic and designs I got for my kit. So we're all continuing to work together on that. And mostly I'll be building testing by myself for now and then uh, building a, a newer version for some that has slightly some changes and testing two simultaneously. Kind of my plans. Wonderful. Okay. okay. Well, and so guys, on that note, it is just about two. So Gordon, thank you, sir. And what, what I want to do here is, in fact, I'm, I'm going to mute everybody out right now. Okay. And I am going to put this on gallery view. Everyone, please give Mr. Charles Crawford a giant hand again for a Q&A session and a wonderful presentation. Um, my apologies for the audio quality in the presentation. At least we got that fixed. I think that we know now we should probably have electronics turned off as much as possible. Um, I, I didn't, again, Mark, uh, Mark Sokol figured that one out. I missed it. So let me see. 